Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. I am Ravi Anupindi, faculty at the Ross School of Business, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. While my main research and teaching interests are in operations and supply chain management, I use these frameworks to study issues in global healthcare delivery. As part of the COVID-19 clinical update course, module three on prevention, I will discuss the COVID-19 testing scale-up challenges in the United States. In this part one, I will present the problem. In a follow-up session, I'll discuss some possible solutions. This talk is based on work jointly conducted with my colleagues, Dr. Rajan Dever and Dr. Lee Schroeder of the medical school, uh, Ms. Surabhi Rajaram, a former student who is now at the Gates Foundation and Ms. Emily Atkins, who is a current MBA student. Our work was supported by the Institute for Health Policy and Innovation at the University of Michigan. One of the important tools in prevention is that of detection through testing so that follow-up actions of contact tracing and isolation can be taken to slow the spread of the disease. As the virus spread across the United States, testing became the actually's heel of US's response. The country was unable to scale up testing capacity leading to long waiting times. As you can show in this, uh, see in this picture, all of these cars are waiting, uh, patients waiting to give uh, samples and the sample collection points are these two tents here. There was shortage of critical ingredients that was hampering capacity scaling. And months into the crisis, we didn't have uh, enough capacity uh, um, available. Even simple things like archaic technology became the choke point for the coronavirus response, all of the test results being faxed into the public health authorities. It was not for any lack of initiatives taken by various entities to scale up testing. In fact, uh, some state governors became very creative and uh, tried their own route to source supplies from foreign countries. Uh, many labs started scaling up capacity, but then found that there were not enough uh, you know, tests to be processed. So it seems to be hinting that there was some imbalance of capacity and demand. Doctors and community groups struggled to tackle the racial disparities in terms of testing because access to testing, et cetera, was not uh, you know, equitable and fair. And as businesses were looking to open up, they had to, to provide safe working conditions, decide whether to test or not to test. Uh, if testing uh, was easily available, this would have been a no-brainer, but it was not, and that was another challenge. So as we got into the summer, a picture that was emerging was that lack of sufficient testing capacity was not only a public health issue, but was also preventing the economy from opening up. Uh, and um, so, as the summer progressed, we seem to be doing a lot more testing. And here are some statistics I'll sh I show you across a few select countries in terms of the total volume of tests being performed. This is cumulative COVID-19 tests by 1,000 people. Uh, and you know, it seems like US is scaling up. So on a volume basis, we may be doing okay, but it seemed like we were not measuring the right performance. A survey done in mid-summer showed that average COVID test turnaround times was about a week or so, and the 95th percentile was about two weeks. It was taking an inordinately long time to process tests, and there was a huge variation across multiple states in the United States. So what was really going on? To better understand the root causes of the problems, it's important to understand the entire testing ecosystem. And here I identified the different players in the testing ecosystem. You have the general public and patients or the population who want to get tested. They're the health professionals that they have to go to who will decide to authorize the test. Then they have to go to the sample collection points to give their samples, who will then send the samples to the labs to process the test. But labs get their equipment as well as supplies from manufacturers. And all of this system has to be coordinated by both the state and federal governments. So to diagnose the root cause of the problem, it is useful to first draw some process maps. The very first process map would be the end-to-end -end testing process. So here's what it looks like. Incoming demand where a uh, population wants to get tested, need to schedule an appointment, then go to a sample collection point. The, once the sample is collected, the collection point will transport the sample to a lab. Lab will perform the, uh, all the uh, process steps needed to complete the test. And once the test is completed, those results have to be reported to the providers as well as the state. 
It's the providers who authorize the test and the provider's responsibility then to report the results to the patient. These are the process steps, kind of uh, separate these out into two different timelines here. The first set of timings here is actual time taken at each one of these process steps. As you will see, the time taken is actually quite low and you know, depending on the batch size of processing, the lab could take up to eight hours to do a test, but that's pretty much it. And the second set of timings that we see here is waiting time or queuing time. So here are the legends for this. The waiting time and queuing time is, could be significantly long. And you can see here in lab anywhere from same day testing to about 14 or more days to complete the testing. What the picture should emerge from here is that the challenge was ma mainly the total long delays were because of waiting time or queuing time. And waiting and queuing happens because I don't have enough capacity, I don't have supplies, I don't have the personnel to perform the test, et cetera. So it gives you an end-to-end -end view of what was really going on uh, in the testing process itself. Now I'll describe the various issues faced by different stakeholders. So if you look at the labs, lack of visibility into the supply process, what, when, and how many supplies uh, labs will get hampers capacity planning. There was a fragmentation of testing platforms. The lab began to invest in multiple testing platforms because they couldn't get the supplies needed on the testing platform they had. Just They were trying to do this to diversify their shortage of supplies. In fact, there was a survey conducted where you looked at academic center labs and health system labs and community hospital labs these had, you know, more than very common to have more than three platforms, you know, about 60%, close to 60% were running more than three platforms. Large commercial labs, of course, had less fragmentation, but still there were many commercial labs that were doing a lot of fragmentation. Such fragmentation across the multiple platforms also meant very fragmented demand signals for the need for supplies itself, as we will explore a little bit later. The other issues lab face technology challenges in capturing and reporting of test results, such as data cleansing efforts, manual uploading leading to further delays. Uh, there were constraints on human resource and capacity, space constraints to expand capacity. They struggled uh, with uh, how to prioritize because there was no guidance from federal or state government about how to prioritize testing of samples. And finally, they didn't have incentives because the, they would get compensated just to perform the test, regardless of how long they took to actually do the test. And depending on which payer was paying for the test, they may get differential compensation for that, uh, uh, perform the test. And therefore, uh, that was creating a barrier for any collaborative work across the, across the different labs as well. Now let's move on to manufacturers. To better understand the perspective of the manufacturers, it's useful to draw what I may call a supply chain map. So supply chain map identifies what I've drawn here is the various entities amongst whom there will be material flow and information flow. So you have the manufacturers of collection kits, manufacturers of test kits, you have the governments, you have the laboratories, you have the collection points. And the two kind of, kinds of flows I identify here, dashed lines are information flows, solid lines are material flows. So what you see is the dashed lines are color coded and they're color coded based on where the information is coming from. And so the picture to kind of uh, really uh, uh, focus on here is that if you focus on manufacturers, let's say of test kits, you see many different colored dashed lines coming in. What this signals really is, they're getting very fragmented demand signals because of multiple pathways through which information might flow. And that really clouds you know, a manufacturer. They, they don't get a true sense of what the demand really is. And with, with lack of clear and consistent demand signals from these quote unquote customers, it impacts their ability to plan production and allocate uh, supplies uh, to who where it needs to go. Further issues uh, on the manufacturer side, they lack guidance on prioritization. And this is prioritization is not about what tests to perform, but how to allocate scarce supply uh, to who needs it across the nation, right? Whether it's labs and states, et cetera. There was, furthermore, there was a law, lack of long-term strategic testing plan at the state or federal level, followed up with associated supply commitments to that prevented manufacturers from really truly understanding what the needs were so that they can make the investment to scale up production capacity. Businesses hate risk. 
So if they don't get firm commitments and you know further view into the future, it's super hard for them to invest in capacity. In addition, there were some regulatory barriers that inhibited rapid innovation for testing. So you submit uh, a new testing strategy and it takes a long time for the testing strategy to be approved. So these uh, barriers also uh, hampered uh, scale up of time. If you look at some other uh, uh, stakeholders here in terms of their issues, sample collection points, they also needed uh, supplies and PPEs to be able to collect the uh, samples. Uh, they need to ensure that they have staffing and training to do this collection in the right way. Did they have the right technology? Many of the collection points had manual data collection processes. So if you're collecting data manually, they don't collect all the information and that becomes a problem for timely reporting of results uh, after the testing is completed. Health professionals lack guidance on who and how to prioritize the test for, which type of test to be used for which use case. They didn't have enough guidelines for that. The general public, of course, uh, you know, faced a lot of issues because broadly anxiety because of long test turnaround, turnaround times that impeded any uh, ability to adhere to quarantine or isolation. Uh, if the testing is taking too long a time, it's super hard for from a behavioral perspective. Limited access to testing sites, especially from some vulnerable populations, you know, they, they didn't have uh, easy access. There was unclear guidance on eligibility to get tested. You know, am I eligible or not eligible? Will uh, somebody pick up the cost for my test? Do I have to pay for it? Does my insurance pay for it? And then there was a lot of publicity about the different types of tests and the inaccuracy in those tests. And that was creating also a lot of uncertainty uh, for the uh, general public about their willingness to get tested, et cetera. At the state level, some of the major issues that we saw was you know, there was imbalance of demand and supply or capacity across the lab network. As you can see, uh, as this graphic shows here, the green bar, for example, shows labs that had demand that was higher than their current capacity and blue bars show demands, labs that had demand that was lower than current capacity. So you can see a lot of imbalance across labs and the state didn't have enough visibility to be able to correct for this imbalance in some ways. They also had limited visibility into supplies coming from the federal government and the manufacturers. What will they get? When will they get? How soon will they get, et cetera? And there were technology bottlenecks. To be able to manage this whole collection of labs and collection points, the main mode of communication and coordination was email and phone, which is not an, which is, cannot be scaled very easily. So that was another technology bottleneck challenge that they had. Finally, you know, the long turnarounds and inconsistent and incomplete reporting of test results by labs also hampered the public health authorities' ability to do containment and mitigation efforts like contact tracing and isolation. The last entity was federal government. The federal government, of course, didn't make sufficient investments in scale-up of testing capacity across the nation. There was, again, a technology challenge, inconsistent data reporting across states that hampered any national response that the, the country could put together. Finally, the uh, scramble was to get more and more tests done, but there was not enough attention being paid on the turnaround times for tests, because if the test turnaround times could be controlled as well, that would significantly you know, impact uh, behavior and performance. And so that was being impeded, uh, not, not happening enough. So this is kind of the diagnosis of the problem, if you will, from the various uh, stakeholders' perspectives. So what are some of the solutions to scaling? Clearly the need for scaling was there very early on. Many experts were articulating the need for significant scale up of testing, but the system appeared to be in a mess as we have diagnosed so far. So what can be done? I would urge you to think about what kinds of actions could be taken. And this is a topic that I will address in part two of this session. So thank you so much and talk to you soon.